Hello and good morning uh, or evening here in Sydney and thank you for joining us for our presentation. Uh, my name is Mark Smith. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Advanced Technical Services in the Infrastructure and Place Division of Transport for New South Wales. I look after the subject matter experts and uh, engineering and technical cohort that support our projects in development, design and delivery. I'm delighted to be joined by a colleague and a good friend of mine, uh, Gavin Kavanagh, who Hello. works as the Senior Manager, Systems Engineering and Asset Resilience within our Safety, Environment and Regulation Division, with custodianship across the entire Transport for New South Wales Agency. Today we're going to take you on uh, through some of the contemporary climate change policy settings enacted here at Transport for New South Wales and focus on the adaptation response we've developed to tackle one of the most challenging elements facing transport infrastructure owners, that of asset resilience. Here in Australia, we're feeling the impacts of climate change in reality. Uh, nowhere else is it more relevant than across our vast transport networks, with its impacts felt at metropolitan regional and national levels. So as I mentioned at the outset, I'll be opening with some context and policy settings, information that applies across all our networks and the enterprise as a whole. Gavin will then take you through some of the asset resilience challenges and climate adaptation responses that we've developed and delivered to date. So uh, without further ado, we'll get into it. So I'm going to start by running through our context and the contemporary climate change policy that was launched in late 2023 by our secretary and our transport minister, the Honourable Joe Halen. Now, um, New South Wales is a big state. Dis despite being Australia's only Australia's fifth largest state, it is bigger than Texas. It is 32 times the size of the United Kingdom. This presents significant challenges for connectivity across our land networks. The tyranny of distance is very real uh, for the community of New South Wales, as is the fact that it routinely it is routinely prone to weather systems and events that range from microclimates through to whole of East Coast events that test the resilience and the performance of our asset base and the service provision we provide. Transport for New South Wales has a significant asset base, as you can see from this slide. An enterprise like ours has assets that service and impact the community every day. We also recognise our standards and asset information uh, and data as assets themselves as part of our holistic approach to asset management philosophy that governs us. With in excess of $61 billion asset base and a circa $7 billion per annum of projects in the pipeline, we present as one of the largest infrastructure management enterprises in Australia, if not the Southern Hemisphere. OK, with the context of our asset base established, we switch the focus now to climate change. This slide uh, is to set the context that the transport sector emissions are static or set to slightly increase until about 2026 under the previous policy settings. This uh, relative no action approach would see would then see a gradual reduction in transport sectoral emissions, but even by 2050, when the economy wide net zero targets kick in, the transport sector is still projected to generate over seven megatons of carbon each year. Not only that, but the transport sector as a whole is projected to be the largest sectorial source of emissions in 2030, overtaking electricity generation. This means it's all, all the more important for us to focus our energies on mitigating the effects of climate change through mitigation, including decarbonising the transport sector and adaptation. Uh, this graphic has been taken from our future transport strategy and shows that transport emissions currently make up 24% of total New South Wales emissions and the transport for New South Wales makes up about 3% of transport sectoral emissions. A small percentage of a large number though is still equates to a large number and hence we need to do all we can to transition our portfolio to net zero. But the key message here is that the multimodal users of our network, including the light vehicle and heavy vehicle owners that we enable, dominate sectoral emissions and hence it's critical that we engage with these stakeholders. This is quite a powerful graphic and it, this indicates why early action on, on emissions reduction or our carbon trajectory is so critical. Uh, 
It is important to recognise that the net zero by 2050 target operates within a context of the global Paris Agreement that requires that we keep global temperatures below two degrees and strive to keep it below 1.5 degrees increase. If we take early action, the total quantum of emissions released is half that of the late action trajectory, even though they both reach the same target at the same time. The opportunities to decarbonize transport are potentially easier than in some sectors such as agriculture, mining or, indust or other industries. And hence it's a further call to action and a strong and compelling case for transport and transportation to take the lead. Our current global trajectory for emissions has us on course for at least a 2.8 degree rise in global temperatures by 2100, which likely means more than three degrees for Australia. To put that in context, a three degree warming is 100% extinction of the Great Barrier Reef. It simply won't exist anymore. It's also important to recognise that all of the legacy emissions we have released in the past means that climate change will continue for millennia after we have reached the two degree point of no return. The key message here is, is, is that it's time for us to set records of emission cuts, not continually set records on temperature change. You might all be asking as a customer focused organisation, what do our customers think about all of this? Uh, well, the Zero Emission Bus Programme commissioned a survey in 2022 that sought to understand how much our customers care, undertaken by EY Sweeney using a statistically representative sample across New South Wales. The survey yielded some really fascinating results. Half of the respondents indicated that by the use of zero emission energy, uh, would improve perceptions of public transport and surprisingly almost a third of customers would be willing to pay extra for zero emission public transport. In support of the drive to increase patronage, 28% would increase how often they travel on public transport if powered by zero emission energy. I've also picked up one particular quote which I know does relate to the zero emission bus program but I think it's broadly representative of the sentiment of customers within the report that was uh, and I quote I think they are covering themselves. They're going to do it in 20 something years. Are we serious about this or not? Many of the comments received and backed up by the data indicate that customers want to see decarbonisation and a dedicated ambition uh, for us to take the lead in, in, in decarbonisation and adaptation. Now it's time to break down the various components of, uh, of decarbonisation and what we call the four pillars of transport decarbonisation. The first pillar are our operational emissions. This represents all our use of energy to power our rail, light rail, metro, bus, ferry and vehicle fleets. Our corporate electricity and fuel consumption. Our use of electricity to power lighting, tunnel ventilation and other equipment on our road networks, our maritime fuel consumption and so on and so on. Our priorities in this space, which make up 3% of New South Wales transport emissions, if you recall, are to, is to focus on electrifying everything and using renewable energy and focusing on demand reduction and energy efficiency activities. The second pillar uh, is our enabled or user emissions, which is represented by all the light and heavy vehicles, including freight users of our network. And the big priorities here are on accelerating the uptake of electric vehicles and supporting infrastructure and embedding the towards net zero emissions philosophy in, across the freight sector. The third pillar is our construction or embodied emissions, which represents all of our use of concrete, asphalt, steel, aluminium, aggregate and other materials, and all of the associated emissions with our construction and maintenance activities. Our core priorities here, our core priorities here are develop, delivering our sustainable infrastructure program, securing a low carbon supply chain and embedding our net zero cities action plan. The fourth or last pillar is focused on investment decision making and how we can leverage our investments to support low carbon targets through the use of economic values for carbon in business cases, marginal abatement costing, valuing sustainable outcomes appropriately and ensuring the veracity of carbon offsetting, offsetting that may be required for drawing down emissions that we can't directly eliminate or mitigate. So it's a complex and busy area. Uh, now that we've set the context of our emissions trajectory and the scale of the challenge that, fa that we face at Transport for New South Wales, it's important to differentiate between the two facets of climate change that we need to manage at Transport. They can sometimes be blurred, even though they require very different approaches. The first facet is our focus on avoiding or reducing emissions that cause climate change. And the key word for this is net zero, which I've spoken to it in the earlier slides. Uh, 
The second, second facet, which focuses on managing the impacts that will occur as a result of climate change that is already baked in. The key words for this second facet is climate change adaptation or resilience. We need to do both at the same time, reduce emissions and manage climate change impacts such as extreme weather events. Uh, but today's conversation is really focused on the adaptation aspect or asset resilience. The core document that draws all of these sources of emissions and our approaches together is our new net zero and climate change policy, which was launched late last year by Minister Halen and Secretary Murray here in New South Wales. The policy sets very ambitious and prescriptive targets that cover our operational, enabled and construction emissions and identifies the principles to support to support effective decision making um, in decarbonisation. The targets within this policy have also been developed to support the achievement of New South Wales economy wide net zero targets and the broader Paris Agreement, which the New South Wales government endorses, but also places transport clearly in a leadership role uh, nationally uh, as in Australia as the only transport agency currently to have set such prescriptive targets. I'm not going to go into detail around these targets themselves as time precludes that, but just to say these targets are intended to provide a, the clear intent behind our decarbonisation efforts. OK, so it's a bit of a whistle stop tour of our climate change policy settings, touching on some of our mitigation approaches focused on decarbonisation and emission reduction. Now I'm delighted to hand over to Gavin, who will take you through the second part of today's presentation, which will focus on climate change adaptation or asset resilience across our rail networks. Over to Great. you, Gavin. Thanks very much, Mark. Yes, yeah, so as Mark has indicated, I'm going to speak to you today about the uh, efforts that we're taking to minimise the impacts of some of the stream disruptive events that we're experiencing, in particular some of the uh, weather um, that we're experiencing in recent times. Slide please, Mark. So uh, this particular slide is demonstrating uh, a weather event that happened about 25 years ago in the northern half of Australia, um, which is located at a place called Catherine. Uh, it's a township in the Northern Territory uh, in the centre of the top half of Australia, about 300 kilometres south of the central part of the northern coastline. Um, from, the di from the diagram that's been displayed there, you can see that there is quite a bit of water that has inundated the town. For that to occur, the water had to fill 12 separate gorges known as Catherine Gorge, in conjunction with the Catherine River that normally has the bridge leading on the northern side of town out of there, um, up to a level of about 100 feet. Um, and, uh, equivalent amount of water, roughly about the size of what would fit into Sydney Harbour uh, or most major ports around the world, um, affected that particular region. This was all part of a particular weather system that moved from the eastern part of Australia in the Great Barrier Reef and covered uh, the entire northern half of Australia at different times, changing from a cyclone into a rain depression on three different occasions. Um, this particular photograph shows the area around Catherine, but that area in the Northern Territory that was impacted covered a portion that was about the size of France and Germany at the time. Now, these kind of weather events um, at that particular point in time were not uh, uncommon, but they weren't regular um, as such. What we are starting to see now is an experience where these are happening more often and we're also seeing them happen further south as well. Slide please, Mark. So an example of that um, in New South Wales that has happened most recently uh, is the uh, rain event that occurred uh, along the Murray-Darling uh, River system, which is the main river system that covers most of Eastern Australia. Um, so a major weather system that uh, hit Queensland in the northeast um, sent quite a bit of water through the actual river system and uh, caused a number of washouts and uh, track closures for our rail network in this particular um, area in western New South Wales. This photograph here is showing a shot of a region called Condolbin, where over a 70 kilometre section, there was about 17 separate washouts that took a period of three and a half months to repair and cut the main line between Perth and Sydney, which is our main east to west coast uh, connection as a result. Uh, it wasn't that it was um, uh, any problems getting it repaired in the sense that it wasn't being done well or properly. 
It's just the impact of that particular event took that long to repair and is an indication of the kind of events that we're experiencing that it's taking longer to recover from. Thanks, Mark. Uh, similarly, on our rail network, this is an example of the effect of a major bushfire that impacted one of our north coast lines where you can see that the actual rail tracks have been buckled and the sleepers have been burnt, uh, which takes a significant amount of recovery again to uh, take place. Note also that it is across a bridge which has uh, was subsequently impacted a couple of years later with uh, flooding. So we're starting to see different types of extreme weather events occur um, all within relatively short periods of time of a couple of years as well too. Slide please, Mark. And it's not just our rail network that's being impacted as well too. Our roads network is uh, significantly impacted when we have our major bushfire season and so on. Any major um, dry season will typically see a number of bushfires um, in the vicinity of hundreds across uh, major fronts burning across the state of New South Wales and other parts of uh, New South Wales. Uh, these roads are critical in terms of evacuation routes and also for our emergency responders to be able to get in and deal with what they can with the bushfires as such and also in terms of being able to recover from the impacts of those uh, particular events. Slide please, Mark. And again, please. Thank you. Similarly, on our roads network, we see the impact of flooding as well too. In this particular photograph in Western New South Wales, a section of a particular highway called uh, the Cobb Highway had uh, roughly about 35 kilometres of road impacted. And in most of these regional centres, this is the only road uh, that connects them to the rest of the state. And as a result, it uh, can have impacts cutting them off for significant periods of time. But as you can see from the actual uh, effects of the road there, they've had to be used while still uninundated uh, to allow major heavy vehicles, including semi trailers and the like, to be able to bring the necessary supplies in and for any sort of evacuations that may need to occur to still happen, which, because of the weight of those vehicles um, in those conditions, causes to further degradation of the road surfaces. Uh, so that's an example of where flooding and um, bushfires in particular, which have been our major concerns, impact some of our uh, actual transport networks from a road and rail perspective. What we are also seeing at this time as well too is uh, not just increased uh, severity of weather events or the regularity of them, but we're also starting to see combined weather effects as well too. Uh, in the Blue Mountains behind where Mark and, uh, where Mark and I are here in Sydney, uh, we're starting to see uh, instances where major bushfires have caused a loss of vegetation that has led um, a short time later to uh, the inability to stabilise soil, uh, which has been followed up by another significant weather event that has been uh, the inundation of significant amounts of rainfall that has caused um, landslides and landslips to occur around our slopes management that has impacted our road and rail networks. And we're starting to see that happen more often as well. Thanks, Mark. So what we're trying to do is uh, make sure that our assets are being uh, in a pos position and a place where we can ensure that they continue as well as we can expect under the circumstances. And we're doing that through the following approach. Thanks, Mark. We endeavour to try to anticipate, adapt, respond, recover and rebound from a range of different disruptive events that occur across our transport network. Slide please, Mark. Now, our main focus at this point in time is the weather and climate um, that is affecting us, as we've just outlined. Uh, but we are also aware that there are a range of different other disruptive events that we are cognizant of and needing to be deal able to deal with, including cyber attacks, activism, economic scarcity, um, health threats or terrorism and the like. Thank you, Mark. But the emphasis is on our uh, uh, weather impacts at this particular point in time. What we're endeavouring to do with our asset resilience approach is make sure that we have our assets uh, safe, secure, available and reliable and able to perform the way that they're meant to. We want to make sure that we are aligned to our um, other New South Wales government counterparts in other departments, along with our federal government and local government agencies and other stakeholder community groups. We try to approach this from a whole of life perspective to anticipate any um, major disruptive events that may be likely or could occur over the life of our assets. And we wanna make sure that they're supported 
both in terms of being able to deliver them and develop them in a resilient state, but also help them to be able to recover, which is obviously costly to be able to do so. We want to make sure that our transport network is consistent and that at least um, our critical assets are online and available, or at least able to recover as quickly as possible. And that when we do recover them, we build them back in better shape and form than what they were using innovative um, and uh, ideal situations to improve things. Thanks, Mark. Some of the ways in which we do that is that we uh, endeavour to predict what our risks and our threats may be. We uh, design and redesign our assets uh, to be able to cope with those disruptive events. We plan for emergencies, we detect those, we respond to them when they happen, we repair them as quickly as we can for those that we need to have back online in a critical sense, and those that take longer to repair or can wait a bit longer, we undertake longer, better um, repairs that will help um, improve things for the future. And we endeavour to learn and adapt from those accordingly. Thanks, Mark. Some of the ways in which we do that is we apply the following techniques. We absorb some of the impacts. We understand that not all of our assets uh, can remain online and we can't have everything able to be resilient and we um, endeavour to categorise those accordingly. We build redundancy into our systems to allow there to be systems that can cope with certain aspects or elements of them being offline and yet being able to uh, come back into service because of that redundancy. Or we introduce humans into the loop where those systems may fail. Similarly, where it is necessary, we do provide protective shielding around our assets and we try to avoid placing them in positions where they are going to um, be at risk of disruptive events. Now, that's easy to do for moving assets, but for those that are fixed assets, um, it requires a bit of planning and preparation and um, some uh, avoidance methods and measures put in place to ensure that we don't um, have to cope with those events when they do happen. Similarly, we also make sure that complexity is avoided where possible and we keep things as simple as straightforward where, where it is um, appropriate and that thereby we make sure that our failures that are likely to occur with our systems uh, during those disruptive events is minimised. We also modularise things so that certain parts of our systems can be replaced where possible and we have a layered defence in depth approach that allows us to be able to cope for the whole of our network. Thank you, Mark. Ultimately, we end up with a, a cycle that uh, our resilience approach to our asset management occurs. Um, we detect, we respond, recover and adapt accordingly. And you can see on the right hand side there that uh, where events do occur in more of a detailed fashion, we are endeavouring to recover from them, detect them and recover from them. But we're also endeavouring to try and make sure that we in future learn from those experiences and uh, either position our assets differently, make them more robust or able to cope with these events when they do occur so that we end up with a better set of assets that are able to cope with things um, should those events occur again. Thanks, Mark. Underpinning our entire approach uh, to this um, effort is our asset resilience strategy and framework for the whole of the New South Wales transport entity. Thanks, Mark. Our asset uh, resilience strategy is part of a much broader um, effort of resilience across our entire organisation that covers off on each of those different aspects highlighted there, including community resilience, economic resilience and uh, supply chain resilience, of which asset resilience is but one part. Asset resilience also links into our asset management approach, uh, which is our underpinning directive on how we manage our infrastructure and assets across transport for New South Wales, which also supports our enterprise resilience approach. Next slide, please, Mark. Our asset management approach is underpinned, as I said, by a number of other frameworks that we have in place, including systems engineering and configuration management. And our asset resilience framework that we have generated is part of that overall approach. Thank you, Mark. So our strategy that we've developed is based upon the ISO 55001 assets uh, management standard, which many of you may be familiar with and you will uh, probably uh, recognise the diagram in the middle there, consisting of the seven different elements of asset management. Uh, what we try to do within Transport for New South Wales is in terms of context for our organisation, the first element was we link into high level whole of government New South Wales policy, including our New South Wales Treasury Asset Management Policy. We take um, our lead from the New South Wales Construction Authority, which is the lead agency across New South Wales for asset resilience and recovery. 
uh, and we try to make sure that it is um, covered within our uh, future transport strategy looking outwards. Um, in terms of planning, uh, we have our asset, our strategic asset and services plans and our asset and services plans that look at the way in which specific types of assets are managed across our, um, our, our different portfolio, which Mark highlighted earlier is quite diverse. So we make sure that those that are responsible for the stewardship and the custodian of those assets actually understand what they are and um, that there is a responsibility with regards to the asset uh, resilience of those and that they need to be cognizant of the particular types of resilience uh, effects that are needed to deal with the disruptive events that may or may not occur. And we encourage them to plan for those well in advance so that they uh, are ready for them when they do happen. We also take our leadership from our um, executive with regards to the type of um, outcomes and expect expectations that they have around uh, our organisational resilience objectives and our framework in conjunction with our technical uh, design standards also factors in resilience um, from a advisory and uh, specification perspective to allow us to make sure that we are giving the correct information to those that um, enact these accordingly. Thank you, Mark. So effectively, what we have is a portfolio of three documents at this stage. We have our asset resilience strategy, which is our central document that's been shown on the screen there at this stage. It provides an outwards facing strategic direction to align us to our other New South Wales government counterparts and to our federal um, and uh, local government uh, colleagues at the same time to ensure that we are all working together in a collective coordinated manner to address um, those types of responses. So we may be linking in with not only transport, elements, but also health, education, law enforcement, and a range of other different entities, homeland security at the federal level and regional development um, as such. Our framework um, on the left hand side there outlines how our response occurs um, internally and how each of the different asset stewards and custodians across our various divisions, branches and agencies are able to uh, undertake threat assessments, determine what is going to be the likely impact on their particular set of assets and to um, identify what are their critical assets and then plan and put forward uh, respective business cases to get the uh, type of funding and projects in place that they need to um, make their assets more, uh, more robust and resilient um, as such. And thirdly and finally, we have our user's resource manual, which is uh, an extrapolation of best practice instances from across the world and across Australia, outside of New South Wales, to enable us to draw, learn, learn and draw upon those experiences um, such as the one I outlined at the start to help us to be able to not have to go through those kind of experiences ourselves, but draw from that and make sure that we have um, factored that into our approach with asset resilience. Thanks, Mark. So overall, our um, asset resilience strategy um, helps us to address our leadership and our planning aspects around our asset management approach within the um, 55001 standard. And our asset resilience framework helps us to be able to provide that support in terms of the detailed um, approach and how to of our uh, asset resilience efforts. Overall, that provides us with a effective baseline, which we are now um, enacting and employing across transport for New South Wales with, again, our different uh, parts of the business that help to ensure that our assets in future will be able to cope with those increasingly uh, difficult disruptive events, both from uh, a weather perspective, but also the other types of disruptive events that we are experiencing. Uh, that concludes our discussion this morning and we now are open to questions and answers. Thanks very much for your time for listening. Um, if uh, you would like to ask a question, please go a go ahead. So thanks from both Mark and I for listening to us this morning. Yeah, yeah thank you everybody. Um, I will look forward to hearing your questions. Over to you.